uh, shall we start? I'd love to start, yeah. So um, it's nice that we're a kind of a small group, so I'd like to make this more of a, a conversation than a, a lecture, if 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 that's uh, with you. Um, I mean, I'm... It's up I'm to you. Happy. It's your your event. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd love your to do hands. it that way. It's more, I think it's more interesting to, to kind it's... of um, uh, just kind of have a have an organic kind of discussion. So let's see how that, that, that goes. Um, and because you um, got in touch with me, um, prompted by the announcement that I was becoming the provost of the Gates Cambridge Trust, um, I thought I'd start just by saying a bit about the Gates Cambridge Trust, what we do and what my role there is. So we are um, at heart a scholarship program and we were established in October 2000 and it was um, a donation of uh, $210 million um, from the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Now, at that time, um, the foundation really was just getting going. Um, it actually operated out of Bill Gates Sr., so Bill Gates, as we know, his father's um, law firm, um, and at some points, I'm told, out of his garage as well. Um, and we were actually the first of their uh, donations outside the US. So um, we helped them in a way to uh, navigate the technicalities, the tax, the kind of other issues uh, from a, a kind of regulatory side of actually making gifts internationally. So who, who would have known then just, you know, what that was all going to grow into? And for us in Cambridge, you know, that that's remains even now today um, the the biggest uh, uh, ever single donation to a UK university. Um, and um, it really, I think, has changed Cambridge um, profoundly, you know, more than just what we do as the Gates Cambridge Trust. So we got going with our first set of students in 2001. Um, by Cambridge standards, the period between the original idea, which was in 1999, and the first student coming as a Gates Cambridge scholar in 2001 is you know, just utterly remarkable. Cambridge doesn't, I can see John smiling at this point, as a veteran of the university governance uh, sort of process, he knows just how long it normally takes to get things done in Cambridge. So that was remarkable. Um, we owe a huge debt to Bill Gates Sr., really our founding father, um, and it was his vision that really propelled us in those early days. So we've been going since 2001, but we were founded in 2000, so we're looking forward to being you know, 25 in 25 in a few years' time. We've uh, provided scholarships to... Um, scholars all over the world apart from the UK and I'll come back to why the ex the UK is the one country in the world that's excluded from the scope of the Gates Cambridge in a moment um, so they've come from over 100 countries and they're now sort of uh, over around 2000 uh, scholars and alumni of the program. I'm the fourth provost um, and I'm the first woman in the role um, so obviously by Cambridge standards we're very young um, but we're thriving and we're thriving not just as a body that gives out funding because one part of Bill Gates Senior's vision was that we would be a community both in Cambridge and then um, when our scholars go out into the world of the alumni as well. So that's why there is a, someone of my role, the provost. Uh, so creating that community in Cambridge um, and maintaining those links globally as well. And later this year, we will finally have our own dedicated uh, uh, sort of building in Cambridge. So the Bill Gates Senior House or Gates House will finally come into existence. That was part of the original vision. Um, in, that, in that part, at least, we've been more true to form of Cambridge. It's taken us 23 years or so to get there. Um, so we're a bit like the, the Rhodes Trust, um, clearly much younger, but part of the sort of thinking behind it in the early days 
was to raise the profile of Cambridge internationally in the way that the Rhodes um, uh, Scholarship does for, for Oxford. Now, I had a little bit of a look at the stats on um, uh, the connections with Trinity and the Gates Cambridge Trust. Um, it's, it's a really strong one. So we have 77 um, new scholars coming into residence this October, and eight of them are heading to Trinity. I, I don't know whether I can say this to this group, but there is one college that's ahead of you in the number of Gates Cambridge scholars. It's it's having this October, um, and on St John's. So, and I know that is always a, a, a friendly rivalry, um, but really, you know, Trinity, St. John's, King's, um, they really attract um, a large number of the Gates Cambridge scholars. You know, they have the international uh, profile and um, our students are international. And we have in total, I think it's 16 Gates Cambridge scholars at, at Trinity in residence there at the moment. and. Overall, there are um, more than 170 scholars at Alumni of Trinity um, and of the Gates Cambridge Trust. So there's quite a, a good overlap there. And even more so, uh, Dame Sally Davis is one of our trustees. We had our most recent uh, Board of Trustees meeting last week. Sally, of course, as you would expect, is a great source of invaluable advice. Um, in some respects, we function like a mini college. So it's fantastic for us that we are able to tap in to her experience as well as that of our other trustees, some of whom are US based, some of them are in uh, the UK. So far, um, we've only had eight Japanese uh, uh, sort of scholars or alumni in the Gates Cambridge community. But at the moment, and I'm really encouraged by that, we actually have three scholars in residence right now. One's doing a PhD in biological sciences, um, wanting to better understand cell behavior in, in stem cells and, and beyond. One's doing a PhD in sociology. And then the third one, which is particularly close to my heart, because you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not originally from Cambridge or England, I'm from Ireland. Um, the third uh, PhD student from um, uh, Japan, who was a guest Cambridge scholar, is doing his PhD in Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic, and is looking at medieval Irish reception of classical literature. I mean, I think just that's a wonderful combination coming from Japan, uh, looking at medieval literature and how that was received into the Celtic, into the Irish culture. Um, so just even that little little group, those three current uh, Japanese students who are Gates Cambridge scholars, you can get a, a little bit of the flavour of the breadth, depth, range of the work of the Gates Cambridge uh, scholars. Um, and I would love, Gerhard, picking up your point earlier about building connections and links. I really want to fly the flag. I want Gates to do Cambridge. that. I mean, that's uh, that was my primary mo motivation before I discovered more about you, <laughs> uh, since I uh, saw what you have been doing and are doing, you know, the view expanded. But uh, I think the more we can do between Trinity, Japan and uh, Bill Gates, I think it will help everybody. Yeah, so please do. I mean, any ideas you have of what we can do. I mean, I talked to Sally and I know that Sally's very keen that when she goes around the world. Uh, I just had a dinner with her on 20th January or February, I think. Uh, and we had the biggest dinner ever uh, of our I can call. imagine. Uh, she she is amazing. She's amazing. I'm so happy that she's become the first woman master in uh, whatever, 500 years or so. <laughs> Absolutely. Great. Yeah. So just a little bit more on the gates before I move on to other things. So, I mean, the, the criteria which we award our scholarships are, of course, academic excellence, but also capacity for leadership and a motivation to improve the lives of others and um, because we are you know, the most generous of the Cam Cambridge University scholarships um highly competitive you know outstanding students who come through um and you know and I obviously I I had been at Cambridge for a long time so I'm very familiar with uh, 
uh, the standard of all of the students that we've met, you know, the undergraduate standard, the postgraduate standard. I've done a lot of undergraduate and postgraduate admissions. Even so, by those very high standards, the Gates Cambridge scholars are a very um, exceptional bunch. Um, and, you know, you look at the uh, candidates um, and you know, there isn't an age limit, but ordinarily they're in their mid 20s, let's say. And you look at how much, you know, they've done in their lives academically, but also NGOs that they've set up, businesses that they founded and like, I think, wow, you know, you know put me to shame I've you know not spent my life in a very productive way by comparison to them so just to remember what you know one of the things that lay behind the Gates Cambridge was in you know uh, sort of raising the profile of Cambridge internationally um felt to be a little bit behind Oxford the Rose Trust being a, a lever in that respect but there were also sort of some other issues in Cambridge that made the Cambridge leadership at that time very receptive to the idea. And it was, first of all, that Cambridge at that point was very much tilted towards being an undergraduate teaching institution. Um, there were postgraduate students, but there weren't the number, particularly in the sort of research programs, as you might expect for a uh, institution of Cambridge's uh, research standing. And also Cambridge was very much tilted towards the UK um, and really didn't have the diversity of the range of international students that, again, you might want or expect Cambridge given its international profile to have. So the Gates program was seen to be a way of addressing the lack of international diversity and the imbalance between undergraduate and postgraduate. The world of Cambridge today is very different, much more uh, evenly distributed between undergraduate and postgraduate, and also um, the number of research students and then the postdocs, so the immediate post PhDs, have grown tremendously as well. And that has contributed in a very important fundamental way to making Cambridge the research powerhouse that it is today internationally, you know, you know, its position in league tables and the like. And so, um, of course, many factors in play to make all of that happen. But I do think that the Gates Cambridge program was um, uh, a material part of the the driver of that to, to sort of really um, uh, sort of change the culture, change the nature of what Cambridge um, does today. So, you know, it's a wonderful job um, and I am very happy doing it. Um, I'm going to go on and talk, you know, next about, you know, how I got there. So my own sort of journey, if you like, but I'm happy to pause in case there are any questions or thoughts about the, the Gates Cambridge side of things. Uh, what's your plan for the future? I mean, you've uh, given a very good picture of uh, the situation today. And uh, I don't know how long you will be in charge of the Gates Foundation, but uh, what do you want to change or what do you want to expand? So I have a reasonable run at it. So um, it's five years and then it's renewable. Um, and it is 50% of my uh, working uh, life is oh, wow. like this. Uh, the other 50 is um, my faculty role as professor. So um, so I have I have the right amount of time to dedicate to it. My immediate focus is um, really building up to uh, 2025 or Silver Jubilee. You know, we were founded as a program uh, with the core value of improving the lives of others. And I want in 25 to be able to tell a very compelling story of why the world is a better place because of the Gates Cambridge program. So what our um, individual scholars and alumni have done, but moving that up to a level of saying, you know, the, the collective impact of that um, 
it, you know, in, in, in its way, this is this is what we've done to fulfill the um, original vision of our founding kind of people, particularly Bill Gates Senior. Um, but then moving ahead as well, looking beyond that, also using the 25 to look forward. Um, um, I want to um, really build up not just the Cambridge in residence community, but the alumni as well. So I'm talking a lot with our alumni sort of uh, association at the moment. Um, you know, we're now kind of a big group. It's been very much bottom up, driven by the alumni themselves, and they've done wonderful things. But now that we have, you know, more than 2000 people all over the world, um, we need to make sure that we have the infrastructure support behind it to really um, support it, make sure that we can have um, uh, uh, the kind of connection and the, con the, the living community that uh, we want to have. Um, you know, really, you know, we, we've seen that over the years with colleges as well. They do much better these days than historically in maintaining active alumni programs and the colleges have invested in supporting that. That's part of my vision for the future as well. I think where I think the what I can guess is where we can do something together here is uh, I think the the your current scholars they are too busy with their research now but the alumni network you see there are 170 Trinity in the world and then Japan is generally under connected to the world. Uh, on many, many dimensions, including also Cambridge. And, uh, you know, Japanese elite people, they told me Japanese elite doesn't know Trinity College. No? And I gave a short speech when the master, uh, Dame Sally Davis, had dinner with us. I can send you the, the manuscript afterwards. And I told them that in Japan, still all my Japanese friends who haven't been to Cambridge, when you talk about the Cambridge College, the first thing they connect with is Harry Potter. And I told the master, we have to change that, you know. Uh, now, that's not the job of the uh, Bill Gates uh, or the Gates Foundation, but it's connected nah, to, uh, like, uh, g g create a stronger connection to Japan would be very, very good, I think, mm. for all sides. And yeah, that's, that's where we can, great. I mean, we have this space here in Japan, so we can do. Yeah, that, would, that, that sounds great to me. So you get more people, more applicants. Uh, three is still not enough, really. <laughs> you could have more, uh, but that the default is really also on the, on the kind of uh, inward lookingness in Japan. Mm. Uh, John, yeah, may I ask a question? Um, Eilish, um, I go back to what you were saying about Cambridge being uh, pretty parochial in 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 the late in the late nineteen nineties. And and then and then you look at it, you look at it today, and you think, well, this is great. It's an enormously successful. Why is it so successful? And if I was still running the audit committee, I'd say it's because it's a it's a model of subsidiarity. But it, but actually, what it is, it's, it's extraordinary. Except and people actually now talk about ecosystems rather than subsidiarity. But it, it but it but it's extraordinarily it's an extraordinarily complex place. I mean, even the announcement of welcome over this last week fits into exactly the same pattern of these little um, villages being built up or being built up around the place. Um, and what you said about about Gates being a, an absolute leader in that, and I guess uh, probably in some ways the Malaysian Trust and Newton Trust as well would be fit into the same sort of same sort of area. Um, do you think that's a model? Do you think it could be followed? Or do you think it's it's like it's like it's like it's like sort of the normal fungus of growth in Cambridge? It happens by accident. Um. I, I think it's a mix of the two. I mean, I think that one of the big advantages of the complexity, and and I say this as someone who, um, you know, my pro vice chancellor role, I would often talk to uh, new senior people pointed to, you know, very prestigious chairs and things and coming to my side, Cambridge. And to begin with, they'd be holding their heads in their hands saying, who do I talk to? You know, mm. where's the rule book kind of thing? Where's the kind of the management line that I can kind of work my way through? Um, and then you talk to them again in about a year or 18 months after they you know, been in Cambridge. And actually, their views usually had changed. They said, OK, it's complicated to work it out. But when you um, find your feet, you begin to realize that 
it's actually very open to new ideas. There isn't yeah. a rigid managerial sort of structure. You can come up with an idea and you can kind of develop it and, and work it sort of through. So actually within that complexity is a lot of diversity um, and an openness, which I would never want to uh, see uh, being lost. At the same time, clearly um, uh, there's there's some inefficiency and frustration in that system that you have to kind of, you know, almost feel like you're reinventing the wheel. So yes, mm -hmm. definitely looking at um, uh, what successful programs um, did and how they did it and learning from that is essential as well. And a very good example of that, very current, is that this year uh, we've just had our first intake of students funded by MasterCard Foundation, and they're coming from Sub-Saharan Africa. It's a program targeting uh, to one-year master's students, particularly for uh, women and people who have been um, displaced and other groups that are you know, very much underrepresented at Cambridge. And so we at the Gates have been working closely with the um, people who are, uh, you know, getting the MasterCard program up and running, um, because we want to share our experience so that, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of, yes, they will do it their own way, but they don't need to kind of reinvent the wheel. Yeah, thanks. And just can I, can I, can I ask a follow-up question, which is complete, completely different, and again, it just comes from being involved in, in, in actually something very comparable elsewhere. If you're sponsoring um, young scholars, one of the, one of the things that's very difficult it, it it it's it's relatively straightforward to have a an alumni program where people wear the wear a badge. It's much it's much it's much more difficult to know. This we probably have familiar. It's a British Academy problem at the moment where you've sponsored young scholars, which you actually want to know years afterwards what was the value of that of that of that sponsorship and how you work that out. I mean, is that something that Gates worries about? It's something that is at the forefront of my um, uh, mind at the moment. And any thoughts you have on that, I'd love to follow up with well, you. I, no, I don't. I mean, I, I, I can send you a British Academy paper on it, but I don't yeah. have any thoughts on it. Yeah. I know, it, it, because, if, you know, particularly if you are a program that, you know, its core value is improving the lives of others. Uh, so many of the people who come as Gates Cambridge Scholars um, uh, you know, they, they do want to make a difference, but in a very um, community driven way. So they want to do a lot of bottom up work, going into sort of research, going into teaching to other forms of public service um, and measuring the impact of that at at the kind of, you know, the, 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 the sort of yeah. um, the level above the individual. Is, is really challenging. So I think yeah. we are kind of giving that a lot of thought and, and I know that others. Um, yeah, sure. At this point, do you mind if I interrupt a little bit? I'd like to introduce a friend of mine who I invited today here, Yuriko Fuji. She has nothing to do directly with Cambridge, but she, I think it uh, fits your current discussion here about how to serve the community. And Yuriko Fuji, she's a medical doctor, and uh, she's been in a study in the US as well, and she's doing uh, was doing research, I think, on pain and other topics and in medical sciences, but now she runs an organization she calls uh, Growth for Health, Syst uh, Health System, I think. And she brings together pharma leaders and government to create growth and advances in Japanese medical system. Uh, Yuriko, do you want to introduce yourself for a second? Uh, okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, Gerhard, for introduction. Hello everyone, very nice to meet you. I'm my name is Yuriko Fuji uh, from Tokyo. Uh, uh, Gerhard kindly invited me today and uh, it's, it's, it's an honor to take part in uh, to under uh, to learn about your endeavors. Uh, to just to, um, uh, introduce myself. I am uh, I'm, I do medical I run a small healthcare think tank which is a family business and we do mainly two things um, uh, early stage medical research for opioids uh, 
and asked for, uh, for strong pain medication in, uh, in collaboration with uh, major research centers in Japan, like National Cancer Center uh, and uh, university medical uh, schools. Um, and also, I, we have been doing uh, uh, organizing uh, study seminars for executives in pharma and um, healthcare uh, business to uh, uh, since Japan's uh, uh, medical re regulation uh, changes quite uh, often, and so to educate uh, as executives uh, with uh, new information and also to uh, prepare them with uh, robust strategies for to continue growth is quite uh, important right now. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, Thank you. Yeah, something like this. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Great to meet you. Great to meet you too. Uh, thank you. And thank you for coming. So um, maybe I'll tell a little bit about myself. So how did I end up in the in the Gates Cambridge role and as a professor in the in the law faculty? So um, I'm a, a long serving member of the Cambridge community. Um, I first arrived in 1980 as an undergraduate student at St. Catherine's College. Um, and I arrived to study law. Now, everything at that point in time was a complete step into the unknown. Um, I was a very different background to the, the typical Cambridge student of perhaps at that time as you might have thought it to be. So I grew up in Northern Ireland. I grew up in the middle of the sectarian conflict that was known around the world as the, the Troubles. Um, and, you know, Cambridge in many ways was as alien to me um, as it was to sort of people coming from much, much further away. You know, even though I spoke English, I had a much stronger accent um, than I do today. So even at the level of communication, it felt a bit difficult at the start. And, you know, I was part of that first generation to go to university. And, you know, I knew very little about law, to be honest, at the time. Um, you know, I chose law because of the security of the career prospect more than anything I really knew about the intellectual challenge of the subject. So uh, I was stepping into the unknown. I was very lucky because I fell on my feet and I really uh, loved my subject. And that became the anchor or the foundation around which I could build everything else. You know, as a lawyer, you need to have a, 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 a a, a, a sort of tendency towards analytical rigor. You need to enjoy critical thinking. You need to be able to to problem solve. I mean, no client no client pays a, a a lawyer just to tell them what the problem is. They want to know a solution. So you have to bring a bit of creativity to what you're doing. And then on the academic side as well, you can also um, engage in more normative thinking as well. So not just what the law is, but what the law should or could be. Um, and I loved that that mix of different skills that are required to be a lawyer. So to begin with, I did my undergraduate degree. I followed the path down to the city of London. Um, I qualified as, as a solicitor with, with the firm that's now Clifford Chance. Uh, back in my day, it hadn't merged. It was Coward Chance. Um, um, I really enjoyed practice. I loved the, the questions that were asked. I loved the sense of, you know, your appreciative boundaries. But I also had a frustration with it because there were so many fascinating questions that you couldn't get to the bottom of because you know you had a client deadline and there was another problem you had to deal with. So I started to feel that my heart wasn't really in, in, in this. It was great, but it wasn't quite what I wanted to do. And that was my pathway back to Cambridge. And that pathway took me to Cambridge, back to my old college, St. Catharines, and after a short while to a lectureship in the law faculty as well. And I've been there ever since. So professionally and personally, Cambridge has been a major part of my life. Um, you know, I, I married another student from St. Catharines. We got married in the college chapel. We've lived in central Cambridge for all of our married lives, got our children there. They're now in their 20s off doing their own things. So I know it's a bit unusual these days to spend 
so much of your career in the same place. And sometimes I think, my goodness, how did that happen? But actually, I also think, you know, what was wonderful for me is that I always had new opportunities, new challenges. It was always that sense of being able to stretch yourself and grow. I mean, again, coming back to the diversity of Cambridge, there are lots of different things you can do. The golden thread throughout, though, has been my research interest and related teaching interests as well. So my research sits at this sort of interface of corporate law, corporate finance and financial regulation. My, my first monograph and my PhD um, was on securitization. Now, this was in the early 1990s at the point in time when this uh, legal technology and financing technology of securitization was very esoteric. And you were really feeling like you were pushing at the boundaries of you know, what, what could be created using existing legal techniques. Of course, um, securitization and its intricacies later became very well known because over time, its use expanded out of control eventually. And securitization was essentially at the heart of what came to be known as the global financial crisis of, of 2008. And you wrote For a me, book about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's still, um, I mean, it's still used as an important technique, but it is better regulated today. So it's sort of, you know, it, it, it developed, it got out of control. It's now being kind of more contained and remains very important as, a, as a could I tool. could I insert my question here? Mm. Uh, whether you are, you know, there's uh, Silicon Valley Bank and there's in in Switzerland there's Credit Suisse and there's even the Wall Street Journal is, say, is, is saying it wasn't just Credit Suisse. Switzerland itself needed uh, rescuing. Uh, so are you going to write a second edition to your book now with? Uh, updated versions well i think you know um the issues the current issues are not directly about securitization as such i think they do raise some uh sort of significant questions um uh, you know they they raise questions something about you know um have we got the right rules do we apply the right rules to the appropriate range of institutions? So one of the discussions in the US and elsewhere at the moment is around, um, you know, clearly you can't regulate a startup or a small institution with the same level of, of intensity that you might apply to uh, JP Morgan, HSBC, they're the globally systemic banks. Uh, so you have to have some proportionality in the rules that you, you have. But if you don't get that right, then the, run, the risk you run is that you let the smaller institutions off too lightly. Um, and although they may be small in life, if they start to have difficulties, then because they are so interconnected, they can actually nonetheless be systemically important and threaten the whole system as well. So that's one of the issues of, you know, yes, we accept the need for proportionality, but how do you make sure that you're not too light touch at the lower end? Second issue, I think, is around, um, you know, if you have the rules, making sure that you actually apply them. So some of what the US kind of studies are showing already about SVB and others is that the supervisors were perhaps, um, if not asleep at the wheel, then maybe sort of dozing off a bit. So making sure that you, know, you actually have um, sort of you know, proper regulation and practice as well as on the books. And then the third point, I think, and this is the Credit Suisse point in particular, um, is, um, you know, some of what we designed after the financial crisis, particularly around how to allow uh, banks to fail safely without contaminating the whole um, uh, uh, sort of system, um, 
so loving wills, resolution procedures and the like, um, you know, they've had their first major test and the Swiss government said they don't work. If you've got a, a big institution, um, you, you need to kind of deal with it over a weekend before the banks open on the Monday and really the structures that, it, you know, that these resolution structures um, that were one of the you're part of the centerpiece really of the post crisis um, um, need to be sort of revisited. So that would be my response to the, the specific question. There's a more general problem, which maybe I got so just to talk about a, a recent article and uh, some thinking that I'm doing a, a lot of the moment about the UK's position. And I think there is an echo of it in in Japan as well, certainly Gerhard from some of our pre uh, sort of uh, methane sort of chat. And this is around competitiveness and the role of competitiveness at the kind of, you know, the, the national level um, and the interrelationship between making your country a competitive place to be as an international financial centre and your regulatory system. Um, this is much discussed in the UK at the moment, you know, post Brexit, um, post pandemic, po you know, we're now at a point where the UK um, is coming to terms and sort of, you know, looking forward to how it positions itself in the world outside the EU. There was a bit of a kind of, um, if you like, a, 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 a a, a, a pause in a sense um first of all because the uk was trying to work out um what room there was to get a special deal with the eu to allow financial services businesses to continue on a essentially kind of cross-border basis um it's now clear that the eu is not really interested in the uk uh, being equivalent to the the EU regime. So actually just keeping the two regimes aligned to each other isn't really going to be particularly advantageous. Um, so the UK now has a sort of sense of, well, what does our regulation look like if we have our own free hand um, within the constraints of the international order? One of the things the UK has done is to really put uh, uh, facilitation of international competitiveness front and centre in its thinking. Um, and it is actually in some legislation going through Parliament at the moment, uh, putting an objective into the mandates of its regulators to facilitate competitiveness. And I find that worrying. I find it worrying not that a country should be concerned about the competitiveness of its financial centre, particularly for the UK, which, um, you know, looks to financial services to make a significant contribution to GDP. Um, I find it concerning to actually put it into the remit of regulators to be part of their job, to be to, to kind of facilitate competitiveness. Um, We've been there before in the UK, before the financial crisis, we had something like this in our legislation. And to quote the now governor of the Bank of England, um, a few years ago, he said, well, that didn't end well for anybody last time. So why are we doing it again? Um, uh, is, is the simple question. If you look at the literature, you look at um, literature about regulatory competition, which is the idea that countries compete with each other um, and use their regulation as a way to compete um, so that you will attract businesses to kind of incorporate in your jurisdiction, to list on your stock exchange, you can attract investors to a capital, because you have a regulatory system that they find sort of easy and attractive to deal with. Um, there is much debate about whether you know that form of competition really does exist, whether regulation alone is a big 
magnet or deterrent to sort of investors and firms and the like. Um, and if it does exist, which direction it takes you in, you know, you, you know, countries, policymakers will always talk about, you know, competing by having high standards. But the reality is, um, you know, and history would demonstrate that it's very easy to slide into lower standards. Now, to take, for example, the ARM, the chip manufacturer, which, you know, brings together uh, Cambridge, because it was a spin out for the university in the early days, or at least with strong connections with the university, and of course, owned by uh, SoftBank. Um, over the last two or three years or so, there has been a very long discussion about uh, the reflotation of ARM and where SoftBank would choose to, to list. And the UK um, spent a long time uh, trying to attract ARM onto the, the London Stock Exchange. That hasn't worked. It's going to list in, in the US. And some of the blame, if you like, um, for that has been attributed to the UK's regulatory regime. That the listing rules in the UK um, were unappealing because they imposed certain requirements on uh, control, you know, large shareholders that didn't apply in the US, and that that was the key factor. Now, of course, I think you should look at your regulation and keep it under view, and particularly for the UK at the moment, given the post-Brexit situation and the fact that you know, EU law did shape a lot. And now you know, it's right to ask the question, is this, is this still appropriate for us in our different situation? But I just have a significant concern, and I'm not alone, there are others, so it's not the, the, the currently popular political view, uh, that um, putting competitiveness so far towards the center of the thinking is dangerous and is like it and has this carries with it this significant risk that we will go too far um and you know the 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 inevitable consequences will follow i might pause there to see if there are any reactions to that view uh, I, 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 arm is uh i i've been always thinking a lot about arm actually one of the founders is Hermann Hauser, who, who you might know, who's also Austrian like I am. And we did our PhDs on the same lab desk in the Cavendish. Uh, I did just after him. And <clears throat> um, my view of it is really, there are two points. Né? One point is that I think they are want to list uh, in US because there's a larger pool of capital. And therefore, it's likely, seems to be likely that SoftBank, uh, ARM is going to, uh, achieve a higher valuation listing in the US than in in uh, uh, UK London Stock Exchange, and I I'm not a regulatory specialist as you are, but my naive amateur view would be that no amount of changes in regulation will increase the pool of capital in UK compared to US, and no amount of changes in the uh, regulations are going to lift the valuation of ARM in in uk no? and that's one point the other point is going back is if you look at the timeline of what happened was that vodafone tried to uh, uh build a business in japan and they acquired the number two uh, mobile operator in a, a telecom company in japan for about 30 billion dollars and they invested another 30 billion then they wrote off about uh, 40 billion or so, and they sold the whole thing for 15 billion and SoftBank acquired that. And uh, now some a company of that uh, 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 character now is worth about $80 billion. So Vodafone lost about on the order of uh, something like 50, 60, $70 billion in Japan. And Based on that, SoftBank acquired what Vodafone couldn't manage in Japan, and that enabled the global rise of SoftBank and enabled them to acquire ARM. So there's a whole chain of events which led to today's uh, situation. But it started by 
SoftBank acquiring ARM. And ARM at that point was a listed company already at the London Stock Exchange. Now, now my, my naive uh, viewpoint is that the London market assigned a certain amount of value to SoftBank. You know, so I, 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 sorry, ARM. ARM was listed on the London Stock Exchange. So in the view of the London investment community at that time, ARM had a certain value. But SoftBank uh, looked at it at the same company, but saw a bigger value, offered more money. Therefore, the ARM directors had a um, had a uh, obligation to sell to SoftBank because they would. It was a fiduciary. Their fiduciary duty required them to sell it at this higher value. My question is: Why is it that SoftBank from Japan sees a higher value in ARM than uh, London Stock Exchange community? And at the current situation, we have the same thing again. The US investment community sees a higher value in ARM than the London uh, community. Do you know, know what I mean? That is, I think it's not a regulatory issue. It's more a perception issue. Why is it that the London community doesn't both at the sale of ARM to SoftBank and obviously now as well, why does the London uh, investment community doesn't see this uh, such a high value in, the, in a technology company like ARM. Do you know what I mean? In my view, that's a fundamental question, in my view. Those are not naive questions. Those are exactly the questions um, that need to be asked. Um, so sort of the nature of sort of the investment, you know, the, the investment culture in the UK, you know, one of the key areas that is now starting to come into focus and I think is, is, is critical is around pension funds and sort of what pension funds uh, invest in and the way that pension funds are regulated, what is shaping the decisions of pension funds. Um, and then the ecosystem point, you know, the, the, um, the analyst community, the experts in valuation, uh, they don't, they're, you know, they are not in the UK, they are not in the London markets for the sort of growth sort of companies um, and, you know, sort of the arms of this world, but also the, the startups, the uh, growth companies that we're seeing coming out of Cambridge all the time. Um, you know, they are, they look to the US, they want, they list in NASDAQ uh, because they see an, they see an investor sort of uh, community, they see an analyst community there. Uh, they don't see that in the UK. And the worry is that uh, although you can be, you know, based in one country, but listed in the US, um, and that can kind of work for a time. But there is, you know, sort of, again and again you see that once you make that move the gradually the center of gravity starts to shift um and you know kind of outcome another cambridge sort of company um you know still based on the biomedical campus until quite recently was dual listed in nasdaq on, and on the junior market in the uk but it's now decided to kind of give up its sort of listing in the UK and be sort of solely listed in NASDAQ. So you can kind of see the sort of drift. I know, John, this is an area of expertise for you as well. Yeah. You probably have a... Have a it's a, it's a, I mean, Ayesha, I mean, it's a wonderful, it raises a gazillion questions. I mean, um, really, really does. I mean, just very quickly, I mean, I'm, I'm probably the, absolutely the only person on the call who's been a director of two failed banks. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so, so, so I know, oh, I know a lot about this. I mean, in 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 two different in twenty five years apart as well. Um, I've also chaired a bank inside the European Union. Um, what is really interesting? I mean, it's a lots and lots of different things. There is a quality which I mean, in banks we used to call regulatory arbitrage. Actually, even even within the umbrella of um, of regulation of regulation in the European Union. So we I'm mean, not the chair of a Dutch bank. We used to find the the Dutch regulator because we were not sy systemic. The Dutch regulator competed with the Frankfurt regulators. So actually that they that 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 happened even 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 within that closed universe. Um the Cambridge capital thing is really really complicated. I mean I've, oddly enough I mean actually um Jason Chin half mentioned it uh, Gerhard on a call. Um the Cambridge capital and small companies is quite interesting not only because of the the pool of capital that might be available to them ultimately, and also because of um, you know that may well be that may well be American more more than elsewhere. 
it's also something to do with the expected outcome of those companies. And actually what Jason said was really persuasive, and that is that he got better advice on how to develop his, his company and float it from dealing with an American venture capital company than he did from than he did from the, the British equivalents. So that wasn't just that you know that the dozy British pension funds wouldn't invest. It was also to do with the smartness of the capital that he was engaged with was better from the state. That 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 is much more concerning to me actually than than whether the, the money is available. I mean it's partly it's driven by regulation, but but actually it, it and it and it's also to do with the ownership that that, 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 that those pools of capital have of comparable companies. But yeah, anyway that that was so I don't like to know. I only can agree. Uh, you know, we are working now with a British uh, uh, regenerative medicine venture on on their next funding round, and so I, I've talked with many, many, many uh, fund managers on it. And the typical Boston-based uh, uh, manager, uh, he has built a, a bio venture sold it for like $10 billion to a Japanese company. And then he sets up the, then he becomes a uh, entrepreneur in residence and building up his venture portfolio as an investor. Whereas a typical European VC uh, who I talk to, um, they do like 20 years of research and then they start become, then they take a course on Harvard uh, in Harvard for one year, how to become a VC. And then they, uh, then they are VC, but they don't have this building background. So I yeah, completely I mean, agree with you. I mean, just, just jumping in before actor. I mean, I mean, I'm being wholly indiscreet. It's been a very. It, it's actually been. A, it is indeed a, a current particular problem on um, a, 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 tr a Trinity. I mean, I, I'm still on the invest an investment committee at Trinity, um, and and we absolutely need to invest more in private companies and actually how to do it effectively is, is unbelievably difficult. I mean, having, you know, what a, well, pick a figure, 300 million pounds is the easy bit. It, it, it's the, it's how to do it is the difficult bit. So, Hector, sorry. I... Um, sorry, I just wanted to jump in because it's quite complicated, isn't it? The, so I work with venture companies who are trying to grow um, and to become listed and they're very much like to list in their home markets. And, um, you know, we do talk to US funds and UK funds and the it's the pools of capital are obviously much bigger and the expertise to grow is bigger. But there's also an ambition block, I feel like, in the UK where people don't think big enough. So I was talking to an AI company, which is one of our um, the biggest AI companies in the UK, and they've got a they've got a head of US that they've just hired. And he's really worried that actually the founders of those businesses are quite happy with a particular scale and don't have any ambition to grow faster or bigger. Now, you know, given what's happened recently, we don't, you know, slow, um, careful growth might be the right answer. But um, to attract people, I think there's just this lack of ambition to get to the next stage that exists in the UK. And if it was just about pools of capital, I mean, we go to investors in the Middle East all day long and there are you know huge checks being written so if that was only the answer people would be quite kind of thinking much more carefully about listing over there and I think another um, point that we're all thinking about is the high profile failures of listings of um, startups that started in the UK um, that have not fared very well post listing and that in my mind is an execution failure by the banks have advised them all of those companies listed far too early um at prices that were <laughs> far too high um and um actually that impacts the market as a whole so those people might have made off like bandits with their fees and made a few vcs a lot of money but a lot of those vcs also had standstill agreements and things so they weren't able to exit you know while the price was still high and so as an as an advisory community of which i'm sort of part we have to i think have to be a bit more careful about thinking much more long term and choosing the companies that we list much more carefully. Mm. This is this is all fascinating. And and you're right that it does raise so many questions and, and some of the things that are kind of, you know, at the top of the headline of competitiveness and everything are actually kind of not the real point. Um, and so next month at the end of June, after the exams and everything else, we're actually kind of doing something that Cambridge is very good at, which is at convening 
people. So we're bringing together in the law faculty um, a group, academics, but also uh, some of the startups uh, working with Cambridge Enterprise and others, bringing in some from the regulatory organisations in the UK, the investors, the pension funds and the like, to just get a group of us around the table to talk about these issues in a kind of, you know, Chatham House rules type closed discussion. But with the I hope that this will kind of move some of the things forward because you can get very stuck in your own little bit of it. Um, but you really do need to look across the whole piece because there are so many different factors in in play. I mean, I'm actually reading um, a history of the London Stock Exchange at the moment and, you know, reading about some of the 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 sort of feeling in the 1950s that, you know, the exchange had lost its way, it didn't know what it was doing. I think, you know, you also do need to bring the sort of perspective on things that, you know, you need to look beyond the moment. And that's one of the things I think that maybe you do as you get older, you sort of, you know, I sort of feel, you know, I started my research career around about 1986, you know, big bang and London's growth, saw the kind of, you know, the changes that were made around 2000 when the UK adopted a single regulator model. And this was seen to be a great thing. And, you know, Japan still has a single regulator. But in the UK, it was then seen to be part of the problem in the crisis. So we changed our sort of model. Um, and then, you know, we had the, the global financial crisis and all of the the, the problems of that, the shift to Europe taking much more of the lead role in sort of setting the rule book, um, and then Brexit and and so so I sort of feel like I've had a you know it's been an exciting sort of ride through all of those uh, uh, sort of twists and turns in the in the market and a long term view is important. Just finally, then, just talking a little bit about and moving on from that idea of Cambridge's convening power and Cambridge as an institution um, and the way in which I've sort of made contribution to that. So, you were the uh, a vice, uh, what's it called? A pro, a pro, a pro vice, vice chancellor. chancellor. Yeah. So, I discovered along the way that um, actually I really enjoyed and got a lot out of also contributing to service the institution um, and that it, it sort of uh, gave me that sort of variety that I, I liked and that I had the capacity for. So um, in the law faculty, um, I was uh, the first sort of woman sort of dean or chair of the, the law faculty, which perhaps wasn't surprising that there wasn't anybody before me in that role because I was also the first woman professor of law at Cambridge. So uh, kind of the, the two in a way sort of followed on from each other. But I really um, enjoyed that. Um, but I also saw that there were- I'm sure they were both on different merits. Come on. <laughs> you know, I know. But um, for me, for me, they kind of, you know, they followed on. Uh, but I also, as, as chair of the law faculty, I could see that there were things that I wanted to kind of uh, perhaps try and change, but I couldn't do it in that role. I needed to have a, a, a university-wide platform. Um, so that was what sort of motivated me to uh, apply to be a pro vice chancellor, which essentially is a secondment into the university leadership for a period, so three years plus three years, so six years in total. And the thing that I really uh, uh, wanted to do, use that platform to achieve, was around um, academic career progression, that to, to sort of modernize the way Cambridge uh, recruits, sort of supports the progression of these high-flying people, uh, and ensures that people have a, a good pathway through to promotion up to, you know, the sort of senior professor level. Um, we weren't doing that as well as we needed to. I felt we weren't funding it sufficiently and we weren't giving people enough support to ensure that they would be able to make the strongest possible application. So that was my that was my core sort of uh, goal in being a pro vice chancellor. Um, it did take me most of those six years 
to get there. Um, I did not expect it to take that long. I mean, there was a sort of um, general feeling that yes, the system needed to change. So I was kind of to that extent pushing at an open door, but um, how to change it and to change it in a way that would work for uh, Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic through to the Institute of Astronomy and everything in between was much more of a sort of challenging job. And that is the challenge of leadership in Cambridge. You know, if you want to do something at scale, um, you do have to work very hard at building a sort of consensus. And you do um, need to kind of know the things that are really important that you do want to stick to and really fight for. And the things that, you know, would be nice to have, but, you know, you can let them go this time around. And, you know, if you make some incremental improvement, you can move forward. So, um, so you know, that's the thing that I'm really kind of, you know, feel that I managed to achieve. Of course, a lot of other things came along as well. And the thing that came along that I hadn't seen at the time when I applied was that I was asked not only to take responsibility for all of the university's staff policies, but also to take on the international remit as well. Um, and to sort of work on really developing uh, strategic partnerships. So moving from simply having a kind of, you know, almost a sort of diplomatic function um, of you know, looking after people when they came to Cambridge, senior visitors and sort of vis visits abroad, but actually really building some more substantial sort of partnerships. Uh, so for example, uh, setting up the Cambridge India Research Foundation, which is to, where to facilitate more funding between Cambridge and and sort of India as well in a sort of tax efficient way, setting up our research lab in Nanjing. Um, sort of the, the first time we'd done anything on that size or scale. Um, you know, the relationship with China is now, you know, for geopolitical reasons, a rather different one, but that was an important uh, uh, move for Cambridge to make at that time. Um, and, um, you know, with Japan, uh, we work closely with the University of Tokyo. We're members of the International Alliance of Research Universities together. And during my time as Pro Vice Chancellor, we also entered another alliance, which is known as the U7 Plus, which was an initiative essentially of uh, President Macron when he was um, leading the G7 and wanted to bring the university voice more fully into those discussions. So developing those networks, uh, being able to travel um, and really engage around the world was really an unexpected bonus of the job. I hadn't planned for that, but I love doing that. Uh, you know, one of the fantastic, well, two things that are interrelated. Uh, you know, when you're on the day to day in your job, as in any job, you tend to kind of, you know, be focusing on problems, getting things done, you know, getting through your days, going abroad, talking to sort of alumni in particular, and realizing just how much Cambridge meant to them, seeing Cambridge through their eyes and getting that little bit of distance and perspective, you know, you can forget about some of the day to day frictions and issues, you can actually see the institution for what it really is and how much it matters. So that was very exhilarating and refreshing. And the other thing as well, you know, sometimes um, when you're very close to things, you know, you, you don't actually hear your colleagues talk about their research often. Um, so again, actually being part of the audience in sort of, you know, Singapore or Mumbai or wherever, listening to one of your colleagues talking about their research and realizing just the, the kind of, you know, the quality of what Cambridge does. Again, a great, great thing to do. The absolutely kind of unexpected things of the whole time as my co-vice chancellor, of course, the two big um, you know, events in the world that came out of you know, not, not quite nowhere in the case of Brexit, but an unexpected result, and then COVID as well. And actually, although putting staff and international partnerships into one portfolio was a bit odd, you know, you might think. Um, given with those two events, it actually had certain key advantages with Brexit. Um, 
you know, I was very much part of the university's response on that, thinking about the implications for staff, but also thinking about Cambridge's place in Europe and international connections. One of the things that I represented Cambridge on and, and felt was really important was some of the positive changes that the UK made to its immigration system in the post-Brexit period, particularly the global talent visa, which was designed specifically with the needs of um, you know, highly qualified academics and researchers in mind, so they could continue to come to Cambridge on uh, the UK on a, a, a kind of efficient visa sort of program. Having spent a number of trips to, in particular, to India, hearing the damaging impact that previous immigration sort of rules in the UK had had on higher education in India, I just knew how important getting some positive improvement in the visa situation and the immigration rules post Brexit was key. And so I'm you know, very happy to contribute on that and felt that Cambridge helped to sort of shape that in a positive way. And then on COVID, you know, um, obviously that was um, very difficult on multiple levels. Um, but uh, thinking particularly around staff and thinking particularly around both international staff who often find themselves either, you know, you know, cut off from their family abroad or abroad and not able to get back to Cambridge. Um, and thinking also about very many of our staff who are you know, accustomed to sort of spending a lot of their time in other countries doing field work, working in archives and everything else. And suddenly all of that stopped. So there was a huge amount that needed to be done around all of those areas where, again, my portfolio, um, strange though it was in some levels, actually helped. And I would want to sort of maybe just end on a on kind of a positive note about um, COVID in particular, uh, because it did really, um, I think, show Cambridge, and I mean Cambridge and now the kind of collegiate Cambridge, all of us together in a sort of positive light. Uh, you know, the little frictions, the little differences, the diversities that sometimes can make things slow. You know, all of that kind of got put aside in the face of this, this you know, sort of utterly kind of unknown, sort of devastating and deeply traumatic sort of event for many people. And so sort of the, you know, being part of the university's goal team and responding to that crisis, you know, it was difficult, but it was also really, um, you know, sort of important and you felt like you were making a, a positive difference because you could actually make decisions and we all did really pull together so um you know uh, I would never have wanted there to have been a situation that required that but given where we were the situation we were in um I am very proud of how the university responded and um you know, I was I, I was glad to have been part of that as part of my my own career and I, I, do you think the university learnt something of value about itself, which continues from that experience? I hope so. Um, yeah. I mean, again, it comes back to that point that we sort of talked about earlier, you know, the kind of, you know, the, the ecosystem is a complex one and it's diverse. Yeah. And, you know, it's a, so, um, I mean, I think that um, positive things that have come out of it, I mean, we use, you know, international connectedness we've discovered that we can all I can be in Tokyo this morning that the thing you know so that's good locally within Cambridge I think that the um, dialogue between the university and the colleges so to the extent that you know there's, there's the 31 colleges plus one university uh, I think that dialogue has got better much more um uh, organic or you know it's built into the systems much more um and in a very sort of um positive way so I hope we hang to that I mean there will always you know with 31 colleges and one university there will always be robust yeah. discussions but uh, Elise thank you so much I think you asked me to come to a conclusion 
at uh, 15, which we are 30 seconds. Um, is that okay? That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, you know, go ahead. Just, I just want to thank you again for, um, you know, what a wonderful way to start my day. So thank you for having me this opportunity. Uh, thank you so very, very much. It's uh, amazing how many fields you covered in this very short time and, and in your uh, you know, so far short life, much more to come. <laughs> so thank you so thank very, you. very much. And I think the university can be, and the Gates Foundation can be very, very proud and happy to have such a wonderful leader in, in you. <laughs> thank you. And I hope to see you thank sometime you. in Tokyo or you are very welcome to our dinners. We have dinners about once a month and I'd love to see you in, in Cambridge when I come next time. Absolutely. Yes, please do keep in touch. Brilliant. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you very Bye. much.